Almost 70 years ago, these men were boys just out of school. In one fell swoop, you ceased being a boy and you became a man. So young to be caught up in the world's darkest hour, the last year of the Second World War. Now in old age, these precious few survivors are all around us. Hidden in plain view. This is the last chance to hear what really happened firsthand. German bodies, Canadian bodies, British bodies. The smell, the stench. That's war. That's war. From the landings on the D-Day beaches, to fighting in the Battle of the Bulge in a freezing winter, and storming through Europe uncovering the true horrors of Nazi Germany. How can human people do that to other human people? How can they do it? It's their story in their words, not the one written by generals and historians. After all these years, still no metal. Where there's original film, we'll see where they fought. Where archive doesn't exist, we'll use real bombs and weapons to illustrate what our veterans went through. This is the story of the final year of World War II in Europe, as told by the last war heroes. You walked when you could and you crawled when you couldn't. All of a sudden, you make them up a, a small group of Germans. Well, it might be a machine gun, it might be a sniper. Then you get down. They were chaotic and busy times. All our officers were gathered to receive orders, and one of these mortars dropped right in the middle of them. The entire officer clan of their company was wiped out in one go. The invasion of Europe was gathering pace as troops and tanks spread across Normandy, pushing back the German front line. So far, the Allies had survived the battles on the D-Day beaches. Tank duels in French towns. Carpet bombing and the battle for Caen. The general's next plan was to take the Falaise region and capture the whole of Normandy. Between the Allies and victory stood an area of raised ground and thick woods. Known as Hill 112, whoever held it could see around for miles. The Germans were under strict orders, keep it at all costs. Frank Quelch arrived in France two weeks after D-Day. This was his first taste of the battlefield. Yes, I suppose I was a callow youth, you know. Would have been bored stiff if I hadn't been for the war, you know. Frank was 18, working in a bus garage. One day, he bumped into a friend who'd just joined the Territorial Army. He was holding up a five-pound note. I said, where'd you get that from? Uh, Terry's, he said. 
I said, what have you been doing? He said, shooting machine guns and all that. I said, what, and they pay you? So I joined, you see. Now he was earning his keep, hunting down German tanks as a gunner on a 17-pound anti-tank gun. Suddenly, in the distance, Frank saw something. He was hull down over the top of the hill, so there was only his turret and a bit of the front showing as he appeared. The first round we fired, don't know where it went. By now, this German tank is pulling back and um, he's disappearing behind some trees, you know. But my number three, he just fired through the trees where he knew the tank was. We saw the clouds of smoke and flame and our commander said, did you hit him? I said, yeah, you know, wasn't scared at all. Yeah. Frank wasn't aware they'd just disturbed one of the most feared German units of the Second World War, the 12th SS Panzer Division. They could see everything we were doing, but because we couldn't see them, you know, we didn't bother about them. They were outside the, outside the hill. Anyway, um, I'm having my breakfast, sausage and whatever. And this mortar bomb went off behind me, knocked me over. So I um, immediately started to take cover. And as I crawled back to me slit trench, this leg was dragging after me. I thought, oh, I've lost my leg, you know. Just then, the heavens opened. was absolutely belting down. And I mean belting down. And we had a, 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 a five minute break, we laid on the grass, and we all went to sleep. And a pouring down the rain, just went to sleep, we were that tired. Ted Roberts had been thrown out of the army twice for lying about his age. After a month on the front line, he now found himself in one of the toughest battles in Normandy. You're on edge all the time. Oh, yeah. Like I say, you can get killed any time, any second. It's as simple as that. The Allies were under orders to force the Germans out of the area. But the enemy had been in Normandy for four years. They were lying in wait. I was behind this barn and I was going to have a cigarette. So I lighted the cigarette up and I looked around the corner and there were two Germans running towards me. I grabbed hold of my rifle and the field they were going to jump into was like a hedge, a big hedge around it, and they jumped onto the edge. That's when I actually fired. And I know I got one because he just toppled over. I think I got the other one, I'm not sure. but. That was a bit frightening as well. And <laughs> I know that close. <laughs> the fields were full of Germans, and Ted had just attracted their attention. When someone fires at you and he misses, you hear like a crack, like a. If you imagine someone getting a whip and going crack with a whip, like that. And that's what you hear. So when I was running, that's what I heard two cracks. 
So I knew someone was actually firing at me. So that's when I got down and, you know, for a while, and then got up running zigzag. And then a bullet hit my arm and it spun me around. And I went back on my back. My tin hat went one way, my rifle went somewhere else. It went through here. But it's six inches further, it gone over through my through the side, through my heart, and I won't be talking to you now. I've never been scared before, and I don't think I'll ever be so scared again. I didn't move a muscle. So if I'd have been, if I'd have done, I'd have been shot again. Ted played dead for what seemed like hours before passing soldiers finally found him. Badly wounded by a mortar bomb, Frank Quelch was found in his slit trench, drifting into unconsciousness. And I was dying, I suppose. I was losing so much blood. I was comfortable and warm, and, and I was annoyed at these blokes lifting me out. I really was annoyed with them, because I was going off to sleep, you know. They loaded us onto this truck, and some were on the floor of the truck, and I was one of those that was across the top. And it was pouring with rain and the rain collected in my stretcher and the water was running off of my stretcher onto the chap below and he called me a dirty so-and-so. He thought I was urinating on him, as if I would. Two months into the battle for Normandy, the Allies had secured the beaches, liberated Caen, and finally captured Hill 112. They were exhausted. After the hill was taken, we were taken out of battle. The division was relieved, and we were sent to a place near Bayeux for rest and recreation. On the rare occasions that soldiers were given a break, they made the most of it. Bombardier Bruce Melanson was still at high school when he signed up to go to war. You never got much time off. And the odd break that you did get was, was fascinating. And I met a girl, of course, and she also had a boyfriend as a colonel. And he left a lot of whiskey there and everything. And I sure helped her to drink it and there was no, not much food around, you know? Food was scarce. Somebody said, there's an underground place down the street here. And I said, yeah, he said, what have they got? He said, eggs and chips, french fries. So I went down and it cost me $54 to get two eggs and 10 French fries, and you didn't get 11 French fries, you got 10. And I bought two more, or again, another batch. So it was $108 it cost me for four eggs and 20 French fries. The money Bruce spent on his pricey egg and chips in 1944 could today buy him dinner, bed and breakfast for two at the Ritz. Mechanic Wally Harris joined up in 1939. He'd already been to South Africa, the Middle East and Sicily. I was approached by a, a lady and she said, um, my, um, my boss says if you want to, you can stay in our house. And uh, I went to his home, I was allowed to have a bath, get cleaned up. So, uh, I slept in a nice bed, and um, can I tell you, because of the way I was, I thought I was a good soldier, even sleeping there in a comfortable place, my rifle was in between my legs, because it's one of those things and you just have to be a bit wary. 
US armored divisions sped through France, liberating village after village, welcomed by elated French civilians. George Maguire remembers their relief only too well. Sometimes we were the first Allied soldiers that they saw. And it was just amazing, I mean, the effect it had on them. They had been under the Germans for four years, and now at last they were free. <laughs> if we stopped our vehicles and got out, I mean, they would just climb all over us. You just can't imagine how glad they were. <laughs> it made you feel wonderful. As US troops stormed towards Paris, Canadian and British allies were ready to break out of Normandy and push the enemy back. The Germans had other ideas. They launched a counterattack several days later. Reinforcements were brought in to try to surround them in what became known as the Falaise Pocket. Soldiers enjoying their break from the front line had their leave cut short. After only three days off, Bill Edwards was rushed back to the battlefield. After our so-called rest, we were then moved to the Falais Pocket. Our division was given the charge of squeezing a part of the Falais Pocket. It was pretty liquid fighting, it was pretty fast moving. Casualties were mounting. Once he'd taken wounded men back to a first aid tent, 18-year-old former shop apprentice Frank Rosier headed back to his unit alone. Now to this edge, as near as you, sat this young German boy, my age, 18, 19. We like cowboys, we went for our guns. I carried a sting gun at that time when I was here and killed him. And I sat on the ground and cried and was sick. I killed a human being. And as I talk to you now, I can see that ginger-headed boy, some mother's son, you know, and that's horrible. Frank had already lost two brothers in the war. Being away from home and family was taking its toll. You think about home all the time. Your mum and dad think about them all the time and uh, but it's a strange thing. Your family becomes your platoon. You depend upon your mate, and you're such a dependent on each other. By now, the men had been fighting for almost two months. They were increasingly weary. Survival was another battle altogether. They had no choice but to scavenge and live off the land. Sometimes we lived on potatoes turnips, whatever we could find. Occasionally you'd be lucky to get some bully beef that was horrible. So we used to, uh, if I met any Americans, we would swap the bully beef for their spam. And that was a treat. We lived on compo rations, and the compo rations were like boxes, and um, they tried to give you a different one each day. And it was pretty good stuff. Even like the best one, you'd have steak and kidney pie. Uh, you'd have uh, streaky bacon for the morning, and things like that. You had powdered tea and sugar and milk, things like that.
I have this photograph of some of our chaps milking a cow, because anybody who'd been involved in farming before the army took pity on a cow that needed milking. And they got some fresh milk. We saw a chicken farm which has been deserted. And I had a battle blouse full of eggs and a couple of chickens we knocked over and proudly going back to the rest of the tomb, we're going to have a feast that night. Mordebon hit me there, came up through my face, hit my skull and came out. And it didn't knock me out. And I sat on the ground, um, more concerned with the yoke and hitting there, running down my blouse and into my trouser legs and trying to tighten the belt on my blouse to stop the yoke going down my legs. And I walked back to my unit. As I approached them, I, the lads saw me face and come running towards me, but I went out like a light and I was unconscious for 10 days. Shrapnel wounds were one of the most common injuries on the battlefield. It was shrapnel from a mortar that cost Frank his right eye. He was evacuated back to England, unlike his brothers who were both killed in action. Well, Dad came there and uh, he looked down the top of the bed. He was six foot four, my father, ex-merchant seaman, and uh, kind of a big lad. And he stood there with tears in his eyes and he cried. He said, at least I got one boy back, he said. The battle against the German counter-attack in the Falaise continued to rage. The generals called in airstrikes to halt the enemy's advance. The Allies sent in squadrons of Typhoon aircraft equipped with machine guns, bombs and rockets. One of the pilots was 21-year-old Canadian John Thompson. Our wing commander went out on a weather recce to see whether the weather was suitable for, for rocket-firing typhoons. And he came back and landed, and he practically taxied right into the intelligence tent. He was so excited. And he said, God, he said, there's thousands of tanks lined up over there and all kinds of, of light armored vehicles and men all heading out eastward. And he said, it, it'll be a great day for us. We just flew constantly that day. Our job would be to strafe the German emplacements and we'd soften up things and make their casualties a little less, hopefully, and make it easier to advance. They give us a grid position. So we'd hustle to that position on the map and the advance will put down red mortar smoke on top of it. And that's your target. Anybody on the ground, it sounded like an express train coming. And when you got too close to the ground, you started to pull out. was an anti-personnel head that exploded on impact. And then there was an armor-piercing head that would go right through the, the armor and explode inside. So 
Some guys said, oh, well, I aimed at the, at the turret and I aimed at the tracks, but I kind of take that with a grain of salt. I mean, I aimed at the tank. Generals thought these airstrikes would be a quick solution to the counter-attack. But for ground troops like Patrick Delaforce and Ron Titterton, it was a different story. Our single biggest problem was the RAF. They bombed and machine-gunned us every day. Well, they came over in twos or threes, and anything they saw moving, they attacked. Although we'd got a big white star on the armored car and brain gun carriers. It's pretty hard to tell whether a tank is a Panzer or a Sherman at six or 7,000 feet. You get hyped up, and, it, and uh, you don't really think you're firing at people, they're killing people. At least I didn't, it never entered my mind that I was killing anybody. They meant well, but they were just bloody careless. It's like a bunch of schoolboys. When you land, you jump out of your aircraft and whack each other over the, over the shoulder and congratulate each other. Not everyone made it back to celebrate. From D-Day, 6th of June till the 18th of August, there was 151 Typhoon pilots shot down and killed. Now that's a lot of people. We had three guys from South Africa come in one morning, three replacement pilots, and by that night, only one left. The other two were dead. I didn't even know their names. The general's plan to take Normandy was now in its final stages. German counterattack had failed. The Allies had them surrounded. Next, the generals ordered their men to close the Falaise pocket. The soldiers found themselves battling in the open countryside, then taking small villages. Street by street, house by house. Fighting in the rubble became a game of chance for the troops. Stan Matulis was one of them. Bob Barberman was getting serious, so he said, fellas, we're gonna get hit sooner or later. Let's go to the house, in that, in that, across the road. So there's about three of us who went into that house. And we went into the biggest room we could, and uh, on the left-hand side, there was a bloody big barrel. A big barrel. And I said, geez, that's, that has to be cider. And I said, oh, geez, I'm so damn thirsty. I'd love to get my, my guzzle down a thing like that, cider. And I crossed this window. Maybe if I had only walked once and then stopped, I may have been okay, but I have a feeling that I walked two times, at least a couple of times, and the second time I was spotted by an, an alert German. And all I knew is I'm twirling and swirling, 
And am I lying on the ground without any feeling? Now I can see and I can talk, but I can't feel and I can't breathe. My breath was stopped for about 30 seconds. Stan had been shot in the neck. And I thought of my mother, I said, geez, this news gets to her. Boy, is she ever gonna cry? And I didn't like the way she cried. She cried so terribly. And now here, I, here I'm going. It's a matter of seconds before I disappear. And... Fizzo grabbed my legs and Johnny grabbed my armpits. But the mortar didn't stop. And he dropped me. He just had to lay down beside me until the mortar exploded somewhere. And they were able to move again. Carry me another 25 yards, and the mortars would come over again. And finally, we saw a military truck, and they carried me, and they dumped me in. And away we went. Oh, God, what a feeling of, what a feeling of relief. In a desperate attempt to slow down the advance, the Germans hid snipers in the crumbling Normandy villages. Jim Holdervale remembers the first time he was almost killed. When a bullet thudded past my head, didn't whistle, didn't warn, it thudded. Cry went up, there was a sniper in the church tower and Jack got our Bren gun out of the truck. And he had to put his glasses on first of all before, <laughs> yeah, it rather amused me to watch him put the gun down and get his glass case out, take the glasses, put the bomb, get down behind the gun, take aim, fire, pull the trigger and nothing happened. The Bren gun had jammed. Jim's men decided to attack the lone sniper with a heavy machine gun. Eventually, a young sniper came out with his hands up and he was taken away. Snipers on both sides played a deadly game of hide and seek. Often working in pairs, one looked for targets, the other took the shot. You cover more area with the binoculars. And if he sees something, he'll drop them down and get the telescope, and, and, and then he'll say, there's something else. And he'll direct my fire, see that dead tree down there, see that rock, and take a shot. I'm a good shot. I was an innocent young fellow, a good soldier. We want to be as well hidden as possible. We were always with camouflage jackets on and camouflage nets. You don't shoot if you don't think you're gonna hit them. You're only giving away your position. They'll get you, they'll get you. There's a cage on the side of the rifle to move the sight one way or the other, depending on how hard the wind's coming or whatever. And then there's another one that raises the sight up to compensate for that trajectory. 
There's a horizontal line and then a post going up through the center line with, with a point. And you just put the point on what you wanted to hit. And you aim and you don't pull the trigger, you squeeze. You don't aim at a man's head, aim at his body. Aim at his body. If you kill him, you kill him. If you wound him, it's better. It's better. When you wound him, you've got hospitals to look after him. People there are, are busy. Hiding out day after day, night after night, snipers like Jim found themselves forming an unusual bond with the enemy. You don't feel the slightest bit of animosity, you know. You don't feel. They're your brothers. There, there's more to them than your family. They are your family. So, so when you catch one of those guys in those sights, you just gruel. It's a, it's a wonderful feeling. It's wonderful. It's a terrible thing to say, but it's a wonderful feeling. As the Allies continued to close the Falaise pocket, the few remaining Germans fought desperately to hold on to the land they'd occupied for over four years. After attacking the enemy throughout the night, the tank crews of the 22nd Dragoon Guards were resting and refueling. Milking cows in the green fields of France became a distant memory for their troop commander, Ian Hamilton. Dawn came, and as it got lighter, we saw two figures approaching us with rifles, so we challenged them, and they immediately dropped to their uh, knees or feet or whatever and fired at us. So we gave them a burst from our Browning. Then we saw a rifle with a helmet on it being held up and we called to him to come here, come here, come and see here. He was a young Hitler youth chap and we caught him through the knee. I thought he needs some medical attention, so I spoke to the doctor and he sent two of his men with a stretcher. They plonked it down beside this boy, because he was a boy, he was 15. And uh, they bent down to pick him up, to put him on it, and he saw their flash, Poland. He did not want to go with them. Nine, 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 he said. But they picked him up anyway and dunked him on the stretcher and carried him off. I've often wondered what happened to him. The Germans were on the defensive. The Allies were advancing, taking village after village. We came to this town, and I remember an old bloke was shouting, Dummy, dummy, come, come, see? 23 year old Corporal Ron Titterton sensed he had to be careful. This bloke took us to this house, and up the stairs, the stairs, I've never come across stairs in my life like it, they're only about that wide. And ooh, ever so steep, see? And he gets us up there. And on this bed is a ruddy great shell, see? Now, he wanted me to move his shell, because it was his bed. And the window was out, and I thought after, how could a shell get in there? It couldn't have been in flight and just landed on the bed, else it'd have been hot. It would have burnt the bed, see? And it seemed all right to me. 
And I thought it might be a booby trap. And this lad said, hey, I'm not moving that. I said, well, look, he'll think we're right cowards if we don't. He's an old man. Despite the risk, Ron felt he had to take the shell out of harm's way. He persuaded his mate to help him carry it outside. And we walked over into the field and kept going till we saw slick trenches, eh? And I said, I'm going to, I'm going to put this in one of these slick trenches. So I just sat down, got my legs over, dropped it and laid it on. And I said, can you hear a ticket? He says, yeah. I said, hey, I wonder if it's still laid out since shell. Anyway, I said, oh, I'm putting this down. So I put it down. We got back, we were talking, walking back into the road. <laughs> yeah, I exploded. The earth went up like that. And I, I, I said, hey, we were lucky, weren't we? By the middle of August, the Germans had all but lost the battle for Normandy. It was a huge victory for the Allies. There was little to celebrate. Over 200,000 Allied soldiers had been killed or wounded. Another quarter of a million Germans suffered the same fate. Bodies littered the battlefield. Oh! That, I never saw such a devastation. Uh, I never saw such destruction. The British Air Force must have caught a, a German convoy. I witnessed in the fields a hundred dead, a hundred dead in the, in the fields. Falaise was one of the most horrible scenes of the entire war. Uh, there were bodies everywhere in the hedges, blown to bits, horses, dozens of horses, and it, it was a terrible sight. Allied troops now moved quickly through Normandy. Wally Harris was a tank mechanic more used to using a wrench than firing a machine gun. His unit was advancing when their convoy ahead came under fire. Wally went on foot to find another way through. I made my way through the village, keeping close against walls uh, because there was so much firing going on. And the next thing I came across was a German half-track vehicle and an 88mm gun. Obviously, I kept out of sight. And obviously, I was scared stiff. I think, what do I do? I'm a, a mechanic, not used to this sort of thing, and haven't been trained how to deal with this sort of thing. And I shook, probably shaking in my boots. I'm very scared. And I suppose eventually I must have plucked up courage because uh, I made my way back to get to my Jeep, where I'd got this 3 0 Browning machine gun that I took from this tank on D Day. Armed with the Browning he'd grabbed from the beach, Wally and his corporal headed back towards the Germans. Eventually, we came across a point where we could look down and see these Germans. And so we laid on the ground, looking down on them, and started firing. And you could see some falling, and then they dispersed. It became quiet for a while. So I thought, well, what I'll do is I'll fire at the half-track, which was loaded up with ammunition. So I fired at that continuously. <laughs> I 
and in a moment it blew up completely. And I think the Germans had probably had had enough and we came across a load of them. We pointed our guns at them and they put their hands up. In a matter of minutes, Wally had become one of World War II's unlikeliest heroes. I'm not a brave person, I don't think. And I suppose something comes over you and you do something which, if you thought about it, you probably wouldn't do. And something just comes over and you just did it. But afterwards, when we was in the village and all these Germans were lined up, scruffy looking lot, I was chuffed to think we'd done that. And it was really good feeling, really nice feeling, really. Wally was awarded the Military Medal for Bravery. He went on to help liberate Brussels. Frank Quelch didn't lose his leg. He became a bus driver, then joined the RAF. Five months after being shot in the neck, Stan Matulis returned to the battlefield. The Allies liberated Paris weeks ahead of schedule. For a brief moment, it looked like the war would be over and the troops home before Christmas. In the next chapter, what lay ahead would be a hard-fought battle for the vital port of Antwerp and the land around the Scheldt estuary. He knew they had us caught in that war. And the next thing was with shells and mortar bombs raining down on us. Paid the price. The battle for the bridge at Arnhem would turn the tide against the Allies. I felt a shame that we had been there and let these people down. To me, it should have never taken place. And for the first time in history, Hitler's enemies would become the victims of his ultimate weapon, the V2. It's like a grisly nightmare. <laughs>